Hello and welcome to Healthy Living. I'm Dr. Donald Pelto, and today I have Dr. Bill Foley here with me. Uh, thanks, Bill, for joining. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Well, uh, I, I love your skeleton in the background to begin. I think that's that's great. And we're going to be talking a little bit about osteopathic medicine. And um, we met a couple of weeks ago. I came to your office, and you told me this whole great story of how you got interested in osteopathic medicine and how it's different than what with people, the traditional allopathic medicine. So tell me a little bit about your story. Sure. Um, so I was working as a chemist. Uh, you know, I graduated from college. I was working as a chemist and my interest originally was to do medical research, um, which was why I was a pre-med chemistry major. As time went on, uh, I became less interested in the pharmaceutical industry. When you're young, you have all these idealistic notions that you're going to, you're going to cure people and save people. And it's not that they're not doing good work in pharmaceuticals, but it, it really felt like there was a lot more, um, you know, managing chronic medications. And that wasn't really what I was interested in. Um, but at that time, I was uh, applying to get my MD PhD and I had, you know, interviewed and had um, some success with that. And then I met an osteopathic physician and uh, this osteopath that I met was practicing what people like me call traditional osteopathy, people who um, hone their skills in the hands-on work of osteopathic manual medicine um, and, and use their hands as their primary primary treatment modality. So I spent a day with this guy and I thought he was just a miracle worker. He was, he was helping these chronic uh, pain patients who had um, been in pain for 20, 30 years and had not received really any benefit from conventional medicine and he was getting him better. So wow. uh, I spent a little bit of time with him and I just said, how do I do what you do? And he sent me, uh, he gave me some literature on osteopathic school and I applied. And, and has it been true to form? Has it been, is that, is that what you're living now? What you saw, is that what you're living? I am, I am. I, it's, it's, it's funny how things come full circle. You know, you go to medical school and you're thinking, you know, am I really gonna, am I really gonna practice this way? Uh, does it really exist? Because it is certainly a minority group of osteopathic physicians that really practice um, essentially traditional osteopathy. But now um, with my wife, we have a practice in Newton and, and in Westboro, and we are treating patients of all ages um, with um, you know, all medical conditions, uh, including chronic pain, which is a lot of what we see, uh, using osteopathic um, manipulative uh, treatments uh, along with you know, medications natural medicine, lifestyle modification supplements to help people get better. Um, and like that original osteopath I met, we see a lot of people who have been failed by um, the conventional medical system. Wow. I think there's a lot of patients that are, that are struggling and they don't know who to see. I think they, they spend money on Amazon like mad and they just right. try to spend it on anything that they see in the newspaper that will maybe hopefully give them hope. Sure. And sure. tell us, for those that don't know about osteopathy versus the other allopathic, explain a little bit about the, dif the differences in maybe people don't know who they're seeing. Maybe they're seeing a, a DO or maybe it's an MD. Right, right. So good question. In, in this country, there are two types of fully licensed physicians. Um, there are MDs and there are DOs, doctors of osteopathic medicine. Both of us go to four years of medical school um, and have to complete some amount of graduate medical education in the form of internship and residencies, uh, depending on what your state uh, laws are. But most people can finish at least three years of residency. Um, we can specialize in any field, just like an MD. So obstetrics, primary care, surgery, uh, dermatology, you name it, uh, osteopathic physicians uh, are practicing in those fields, um, emergency medicine. 
Um, but the difference is, is that we have extra training in um, both osteopathic philosophy and osteopathic manipulative treatment. And uh, what that means is uh, the philosophy is simple. It's when we see our patients, we see them as whole patients. Mm -hmm. And the term holistic is thrown around a lot these days, but it means head to toe. It does mean mind, body, spirit, but it really just you know, seeing your patient for who they are and try not to reduce them to their one chief complaint or their one disease entity. Um, we're looking at the structure function relationship in the body. So, you know, there's a lot of practitioners that work with structure, surgeons, massage therapists, chiropractors, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of practitioners working with function. So your, your, your internists and your, your subspecialists, cardiologists, gastroenterologists, but really we're trying to do both. Uh, I'm trying to see people both from the anatomic side as well as from the physiologic side. And that's where the osteopathic manipulative medicine comes in is working to perfect uh, anatomy to aid in perfecting physiology. And then, and then um, we take that philosophy and we use it not only to treat people with our hands, but also to tailor how we want them to change their lifestyles or uh, take medications um, or supplements. Um, yeah, I interesting. And you say it's not that, like how many comparative, uh, 10,000 in, in the United States? How many, how many are there of you in the United States? That's a, that's, that's really, and that's a hard number to calculate because we're, we're growing. We're mm -hmm. the fastest growing healthcare um, uh, industry in America right now. But generally, um, osteopathic physicians make up about 10% of all the doctors in the United States. Mm -hmm. And with that being said, however, most DOs do practice just like MDs. And okay. you, most people have probably met a DO and didn't know it. There's over a thousand DOs in the state of Massachusetts. And uh, we still feel like we're the best kept secret <laughs> in medicine. Um, but for those of us who, who practice traditional osteopathy, um, of the DOs that are out there, it's probably only a small percentage, one to 5% of us. Wow, wow. And uh, in terms of patients, um, kind of maybe you can give me a, an example of one or two patients that, that have had this, because I went there, visited you, and you kind of did a, I don't know if it's called a, a treatment or a manipulation on me, I don't know what the proper term is. Yeah. And, and, and you worked just, I was thinking you would sit down and talk to me, but you worked right with your hands. And that's something we're not so used to. And you said, you know, Don, this has been thousands and thousands of hours perfecting and teaching and learning how to use my hands and feel just the slightest changes in the spine and other areas like that. Right. So tell me, tell me how some people get to you. Are they coming to you primarily or do they like try everything else and then they finally find uh, Bill? How does that work? <laughs> right. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a few you know, common pathways that people take. The, the first one, which has um, become more common um, uh, in recent years, is I find people who are interested in non-pharmaceuticals and they don't want surgery, um, and rightly so. They're 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 kind of that middle of the road kind of patient. They're not sick enough to absolutely need something like that, um, but they're not feeling so great. They want to feel better. So I, I have been in the last five years or so, I have met a lot of patients who are just interested in, in something alternative to medications and surgery. But it's still not the biggest percentage of people. Most people come to me because I'm the doctor of last resort. They've, they've seen their primary care doctor, they've seen an orthopedist, they've seen a spine specialist, they've seen a neurologist and a physical medicine and rehabilitation doctor. They've tried acupuncture, chiropractics, massage, mm -hmm. and they're really just coming to the end of where they're either in lots of pain and no one's helping them, or they're chronically fatigued, or they're having functional intestinal disorders like IBS. And, um, you know, in conventional medicine, we just don't have really great answers for people with non-life-threatening, mild to moderate chronic problems that disturb life, that, that inhibit our ability to work, take care of our families and be happy, but not necessarily uh, are going to end up um, in the hospital for. And so those wow. are the two main people I see. 
Yeah. And, and, and so I just think of that. If someone's come to see me maybe as a second or third opinion, right. I just take a deep breath and I think, how long is this going to take me? Uh, because you have to go through all of that. So you probably spend a little, maybe a little bit more time with them, at least the first visit. Uh, yeah. And things yeah. Like so, that. So our, our time schedules are we schedule uh, one hour for new patients and 30 minutes for follow-ups for all of our patients. But we always tell our patients we're not on the clock. We're going to finish when we're done. Um, the other thing that we do to help mitigate that time problem is new patients. We, ask, we send them forms to fill out before we see them. And we ask them to send all of the paperwork that we give them, but also any other imaging studies, consultations or lab work that they've had done uh, ahead of time so we can review it. And we do, we spend a lot of time reviewing that stuff and, and going over it. And even, even throughout the treatment process, sometimes months later, I'm going back over it and trying to figure out how else can I help this patient if they're not progressing at the rate that I think they should. And I think I was there, if I don't try not mistaken, you said you collaborate with, with, with the other, with your wife that's in the practice as well, in terms of running ideas by each other. There's a lot of collaboration, right? Because you're, you don't know, and no one knows everything. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's great to be married to someone who does exactly what you do because um, just your regular dinner conversation <laughs> uh, that we all have about work, uh, you know, that comes up and we, and we do, we, we brainstorm with patients. Um, but I also belong to um, uh, several study groups, osteopathic study groups. So I have, um, a couple of groups uh, of 20 or more people that if I'm really um, stuck or they're really stuck, we can email each other. And then all of a sudden you get 25 opinions on what, hmm. what might be going on or what else you can do, which I think is very similar. I'm sure in your field too, you, you talk with your, your partners, your colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a really tough case, I know in, in um, oncology, there's, there's tumor board meetings and and things like that and family medicine, which I'm board certified in, we used to have grand rounds in family medicine to present, you know, really difficult cases. Um, but I collaborate with my wife, with my friends, uh, colleagues, but I also collaborate with other people who are not necessarily osteopathic physicians. I collaborate with acupuncturists on a regular basis, um, orthopedic surgeons, as you can imagine, mm -hmm. physical therapists. You, you, I think all of us, develop a network of people that we, you know, we need to work together and bounce ideas off of. Yeah, I, I think that's, one, it makes your patients helpful because you know you don't have everything, but you also know the right people to send them to. Right. And, and that's where I think seeing someone that only does kind of really challenging things, maybe you, you say, you know, you came to see me, I'll listen, I can't help you, but you know, I have these two or three names that might be able to help you. And that's the, that's the benefit, I think, of seeing someone versus just Googling the problem. Absolutely. Um, I, it, it's, it's a, the benefit of being in practice for about 20 years now. Um, not only have, have I met um, and worked with amazing practitioners, but it's also being able to quickly recognize something that you've seen and you're good at. Yep. And something that you, you recognize as, oh, I, I, I've seen this before. I've, I've never helped anybody with this problem, but I know somebody who can. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, that's powerful. Uh, Bill, as we finish up here, I, wanna, I want you to talk a little bit about your work with cancer in the, in the chronic care that you help with these patients. Could you maybe tell us a couple of patient experiences or ways that you've helped some patients? Absolutely. Um, as you know, cancer rates are on the rise. And when I started um, in medicine, um, even as a, as a primary care doctor, which is how I started, uh, I, I didn't see that many cancer patients. Uh, they, were, they were rare and occasional and I always had someone in my practice, but it seems like in the last five, maybe even 10 years, but certainly the last five years, um, more and more people are coming to this office anyways with cancer. Um, we're, we're not oncologists, we're not cancer surgeons, or, or but <clears throat> we are able to add something that can um, help these people. Um, in particular, um, we help mitigate the symptoms uh, from the cancer itself, whether that's pain or fatigue, uh, but also mitigate the symptoms from the treatment themselves. I mean, chemotherapy is not fun. Um, uh, surgery is not fun. Radiation therapy um, is really tough on the body. And so while 
we, we can't cure their cancers, uh, nor are we saying that they shouldn't get conventional medical treatment. If you can optimize circulation, if you can optimize venous and lymphatic drainage, which helps get all the, the, the junk out of the body, all that, um, that dying material and inflammatory fluids that are being produced both by the disease, but also by the treatment itself. Mm -hmm. If you can help drain those areas, um, you, you'll have less pain because inflammation causes pain. You'll have quicker healing because over inflammation Inflammation is somewhat necessary for healing, but if when it when it becomes chronic and ongoing, it leads to damage of tissue and and um, lack of repair, and then fatigue. We think of fatigue in this sense, in cancer, anyways, as just huge metabolic overload, pathologic metabolic overload, and they're just overwhelmed with the body fighting cancer, and the chemo fighting cancer, and radiation fighting cancer. And so their, their body is just exhausted. And if you can help drain these systems, and we do that, we do that directly with lymphatic drainage techniques, but we also do it indirectly where we treat um, strains or restrictions in the myofascia, uh, which would be a, a very hands-on myofascial release, balanced ligamentous tension type treatment. It's gentle, it's soft, but when these fascias are tight, the lymphatics and the veins can't drain mm -hmm. that metabolic waste the way it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. Fascia is really the, the fluid highway that drains um, you know, these tissues. So those are the two main ways that we're able to help these people hands-on. Wow. Um, and that brings up a, a good patient of mine. She's had, if you can believe it, the poor thing has had um, breast cancer three times survived all three times, um, but really um, suffered with chemo. And you know, with the nausea, vomiting, pain, swelling, fatigue. So we treated her every one to two weeks, my wife and I, um, for basically as much as she needed. We were symptomatic treatment. And by doing these simple lymphatic treatments and these simple myofascial release techniques, we were able to help her body optimize so that she felt better. Um, and I think it's a testament to how much it helped because we treated her the first time <laughs> while she went through cancer treatment. And she felt so good with that, that she called us for the second one and the third one as well. Um, you know, in her own words, uh, she didn't think that she could get through the exhaustion and the, the pain. Um, and, and she, and in particular, even mentioned how when she would get treated, her nausea would go away for three to five days after a treatment. Wow. Um, regardless of the mechanism, if there's any way that I can help one of my patients, uh, you know, that's, it's, it's an honor and a, and a bonus. And it's humbling sometimes to see these, these symptoms uh, resolve. Um, recently, I had a patient with stage four lung cancer. And the way I was able to help uh, him was a little bit differently. I, I did treat him. Um, I would say that my treatments provided uh, certainly uh, pain relief, not really much on the fatigue end. But one of the things I was able to do for him is I put him in contact with um, you know this network that I have. So there are nutritionists who specialize in uh, cancer patients that I set him up with, and he he terrible diet. He needed a lot of help. But on, it was not just supplements. It's, you know, how do you eat right? How do you take care of yourself? Mm -hmm. You know, how can you get fruits and vegetables into your diet every day and do it in a way that um, a single man is such as himself. So he's single, alone, and now sick. How, how are we going to make it easy enough that you can, you can nourish yourself? And um, I think that was one of the main things I did for him, although there was some pain relief. I think really hooking him up with my... Uh, with an acupuncturist in his area who provided him with um, uh, Chinese herbs as well as the needles. Mm -hmm. and, and really with that nutritionist, I think it was a lifesaver for him. Um, and then um, one of my patients I always talk about, and I, I, you know, I think we all have these miracles in our practice and we like to talk about them all the time. I wish that every patient I had was a miracle, but I had this woman years ago and she had a, a spinal tumor which is, as you can imagine, is agonizing. She was in a wheelchair, she couldn't walk. Um, surgery was not possible. Um, 
although they, they were still talks about doing it just because she was in so much pain, uh, radiation hadn't shrunk the tumor enough to stop the pain. Um, so she came into my office, this is about 15 years ago now. And I remember telling her, I have, I have no idea what I can do for you. I mean, I looked at her MRIs, the tumor is pressing on the spinal cord. I, well, she got on the table and I treated her uh, very gently, very gentle techniques, ligamentous articular strain techniques. My, my thought was if I could just get a little bit of space in the spine, the tightness that she had, she was an elderly woman who already was tight before mm -hmm. she had cancer. If I could just get a little bit of space, a little bit of movement, maybe I could provide a little bit of relief. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I was looking for 10% pain reduction. I wasn't looking for miracles. But the truth is, Don, she got off the table, didn't need her wheelchair. She felt great. Um, I always, I, she's passed since. It's been 15 years. She was 87 then. But I, I, I see her family once in a while, and I still say, I don't think the tumor was causing her pain <laughs> only because I, I didn't reduce the tumor. I didn't eliminate the tumor. Um, so she, she probably had just your average regular uh, um, chronic, uh, not chronic, acute low back problems, spinal disease. And um, with some very gentle osteopathic treatments, she had pain resolution. Hmm. Um, so you, know, you can't, you, you can't trade that kind of quality of life. Yeah. Um, and uh, again, was I lucky? Absolutely. Uh, I never thought in a million years that I could have any effect. I didn't have any effect on the cancer. Um, but to see uh, pain relief, to see a, a, a true, I can still picture that true, genuine smile on her face uh, was amazing. That's awesome. But, but, but in general, I would say that we, we, we help you know, at least four out of five people with pain and fatigue to reduce it you know, at least by, you know, 25 to 30%. And that's what we're looking for. That's great, Bill. I, I, I love the stories. I think that really rings home with everyone kind of watching here. Um, I, I think we covered a lot of good, uh, good, good topics. I'd love to have you back another day. If people are interested, uh, Bill, in learning more about you, is there a website that they can go to, to, to learn more? Absolutely. They can go to www.bostonosteopathichealth.com or they can check us out on Facebook. Um, and we love phone calls. Anyone can feel free to call the office 617-431-4451. We're always happy to talk osteopathy. Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Hey guys, thank you for watching Healthy Living. You're going to find a few links here I'd like you to click. One is to subscribe to this channel on YouTube. Uh, also, you can learn more. There are some videos here you can see.